Right, so I named the talk the long and the short of things, of it. Uh, I'll come back to why I named it that in just a minute, but first I want to introduce who my team is. But so we just did that, so I'll do it very quickly. Uh, we're Genomic Applications, we're part of the bigger applications team run by Dan Turner, and we're in three different locations. I'm here in New York, we also have people in Oxford now. And what we do, is, as Zoe said, is we try to showcase the technology in the best possible way, either just um, internally or with customers. So we do a lot of different projects in a lot of different fields, and I only have time to talk about <coughs> excuse me, a few of them today. But outside, we have very many posters from all of the applications team. And you should go have a look at them, and, and if you have any questions, there'll be people with them. Right. So I'm sure you've seen this slide many times. It's what we always show when we introduce uh, the company. It, is, it contains our main vision for the company, which is to sequence anything by anyone, anywhere. And that actually says a lot about the technology, as also as Gordon mentioned before. Um, the anything, especially, is something that we, um, we talk a lot about, especially that we can do very, very uniquely, we can sequence long reads. And I think you all know that. So we're known for our long read sequencing, um, I think, an ultra long read. But really, there's no reason why you'd only sequence long things on nanopores. Um, whatever you put into the nanopore is what but the fragments you put in are the reads that you're going to get out, um, which I think everyone knows at this point. So I tried to kind of summarize this in this graph. So th this here is how many bases you have. And up here, I'm trying to show what kind of samples you might have and what kind of read things those might have. And this is not at exhaustive at all. Um, so bear with me if I forgot half of the samples that you're working on. But this sort of spans the whole area, that you have things that are really short, you have things that are really long. And down below, I tried to put up some of the major applications that people might want to, to use the nanopore sequencing for, um, which also ranges a lot in, in length. I think it's fair to say that the majority of everyone who sequences on nanopores at the moment certainly are in, are in this type of um, area here. So around, let's say, 1,500 to 2,000 bases going up to, let's say, 150K. I know that you can... People have done libraries that have been much longer, so there are people that have done in library in 50s of, let's say, 150 KB, which is very impressive, but it makes the library prep a little bit more difficult. There's also the famous uh, ultra-long read by, um, by Matt Luce's team, uh, which is, I think, I think this is still the record, so 2.3 megabases, which is you know, an incredibly long read. Um, but so what I wanted to talk about today is sort of this other side of the spectrum, the really short reads. There really isn't any reason why you shouldn't be able to sequence short reads on nanopores, but not many people do it because we uniquely sequence the long ones. So I thought this is a good opportunity to talk about the short ones. Because each nanopore is able to take on a new uh, read every time, uh, so this is just to show that we can sequence the whole thing. Now, because a, a nanopore can take in a new fragment every time it's done sequencing another fragment, um, re you really don't lose anything on throughput, even though you sequence short reads. So unlike other technologies, you, don't, um, you can just keep sequencing short ones, and you'll get the same type of throughput. So that's what my talk is. The long and the short of it is that I'm going to try and talk about two short read applications. But because we can't help ourselves in talking about long things, Owen is going to come up later and talk about a long read application, Porsche, as Andrew mentioned. So before I start with my short read applications, I just have to mention that we, as a company, sell for research only. We're not clinically um, FDA approved yet. <clears throat> Right, so the first project I want to talk about is not ultra short reads, it's kind of longish short reads, 1500 bases ish, and we're going to use a cystic fibrosis panel for variant calling for that. So, briefly, cystic fibrosis is a recessive genetic disorder. It affects uh, the lungs and the, and the digestive system most of the patients, and roughly all of the, or all of the, um, the gene that's responsible for, or the mutation in the gene that's responsible for this is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator protein, or CFTR. And there's around 139 verified mutations in this gene that, can, that are clinically relevant. There are many, oh, there's, a, there's a genetic test that you can use that uses these, um, um, that uses short read technology to, se to, to sequence. And I'm going to call those reads ultra short reads at this point. Um, so this genetic test is used for things like carrier screening and also to diagnose and to, um, to, to determine treatment. And in this panel, they detect all the 139 clinically relevant um, mutations in AD amplicons. Um, so what we did, or what we've, we've known, what's been shown, along, been shown many times in literature, is that when you have these ultra-short reads, um, actually you end up uh, having trouble with paralogous pseudogenes. 
So this is that if your, your primary pair on these short reads, in this specific example around exon 10, actually also ha maps to three different pseudogenes, which is a problem because then the results you get out are, are, are muddy. <clears throat> so what we did is we expanded all the amplicons to 1,500 bases instead of the short, ultra short reads. And, um, and so we then are able to map uniquely to the parts of the genome. And also, instead of having 80 amplicons, we have 24. So we tried this on a sample that has, uh, an, has known SNPs, um, and we multiplexed the PCR in one reaction and ran out a minion, and this is the type of result that you get out when you map it back. So down here you have all the amplicons, up here you have the gene. Um, this panel, or this is the panel, the ultra short read panel from, from literature, and this is the confirmed SNPs, the, these two. And down here you have our results where we find these two SNPs and they're heterogeneous, we find them very easily. And then actually also we find this extra SNP. And really, um, this SNP lands outside of the sh ultra short read normal uh, uh, primer, so it's actually not picked up by the normal genetic test, but we pick it up. And if you go into literature, you'll find that this SNP is actually, has actually been associated with CF, so we're quite sure that it's real. So we think that this, like, this 24 amplicon panel is a great way to, to use for, as, as a genetic test, and really it's, it's ultra-fast. <clears throat> so um, Andrew spoke a bit about this, but actually we found that, we, so we only go to 100x, 150x coverage to call these SNPs, and we find that within the first five minutes of sequencing, we get to, the, this is on a minion, we get to this 150x coverage. <clears throat> so really there's no need to, to use a minion for this, you should probably use a fungal or alternatively, you multiplex. So we did that here. So <clears throat> we used the MUTCF2 panel, which is 23 uh, different samples that all have uh, at least one clinically relevant mutation in them, um, CF mutation. And then we, multi we multiplexed the PCRs on each sample, we then um, barcoded them and pooled them and loaded them on the minion. And this is sort of examples of the results that you get out, but more interestingly, these are sort of um, all together. These are the uh, sort of summary of the results. In this setting, we got, um, we got 34 out of uh, 36 you know, mutations we called correctly. We, have, we unfortunately have two uh, false negatives and no false positives, which gets us to around 94% sensitivity and 100% specificity. And these two um, are, of course, extremely annoying, um, but we are, we have, w when we look at the alignments, we actually see them there. <clears throat> so I think it's a bioinformatics, so it is a bioinformatics issue. We call with Claire, and there are a few parameters we can still mess around with to get this right. So we're quite confident that this is going to be um, a good way to going forward for us for looking at the cystic fibrosis. The next one I'm going to talk about is now ultra short reads. Um, and we're going to use uh, low frequency variant calling to showcase these ultra long, ultra short, sorry, ultra short reads and on an um, oncology cell free panel. <clears throat> so many of you probably know that in our blood there's lots of cell free DNA. So this is, cell, this is DNA that when cells die, they release this DNA into the blood. This is perfectly normal, it happens in all of us. Now if you have a tumor, that DNA also is released into the blood when the tumor cells die off. Um, and you can tell which DNA comes from the tumor by looking at the cancer-related mutations. Um, if you're far along in the progression of the disease, you'll have a lot of tumor DNA there. If you're early on in the disease, there'll be very little tumor DNA. Um, <clears throat> but you also you want to catch it early, so that's what we're looking for. So you need a test that's extremely sensitive to find out these low-frequency variants. It's further complicated by the fact that the typical cell-free DNA is only 100 to 200 base pairs. Um, so what we did is we worked on a hybrid capture method that uses these biotinylated probes. Let me go over here. Um, and then we incorporate unique molecular identifiers, or UMIs. So it's a fairly standard um, library prep if you're used to hybrid capture. The UMIs are added before any sort of amplification, and they have a dual purpose. So the first purpose is to avoid PCR bias. So you cluster all, all the reads that have the same UMI can be clustered, and you know that they came from the same parent molecule. And secondly, you can use these clusters to polish, the reads can polish each other, and you can get rid of PCR and sequencing errors and get really high accuracy single molecule sequences out. <clears throat> so I, I should mention Phil and Phil. They're the two people who actually did this, lab side and analysis side, and you can talk to them after if you have any questions. But we used the uh, Roche Avenue um, circulating tumor um, assay, which is a pan cancer assay that, um, that uh, targets around 81 kilobases of the genome in, from sort of 17 cancer associated genes. 
Uh, they don't tell you everything about what they target, so we had to guess a little bit, but um, at least we know that they do target uh, BRCA1, which is in there. They do tell us that. Now, we didn't actually use cell-free DNA for this first experiment. We did it with uh, heavily sheared genomic DNA. So we sheared genomic DNA down to 160 bases. So we used 95% um, we used of the reference uh, sample NA12878, which is, in this case, a control. And then we used 5% of another sample that has a, an A to C mutation in X and 4 of the BRCA1 gene. And down here you see this is the reads just coming off the promethine and how they align to the BRCA1, and we get co good coverage on all um, exons. So this is the bioinformatics uh, protocol or pipeline, which is mostly around the UMIs. So what happens is you sort of align the reads to the genome, you pull them out based on where they map to the genome, and then you extract the UMIs. We used vSearch for that, and then you, um, you, you polish and do all the clustering with SPOA, RACON, and MEDACA, <coughs> which are all publicly available software. And then we do SNP calling with something called VARSCAN2, which is normally used uh, for, for other short read sequences, but because we have so high accuracy at this point, it can also be used for nanopore reads. Um, and then you'll notice from this graph that if you have a cluster size, this UMI cluster size of above 8, you get to read accuracy of around 99%. And if you get to around 18 to 20, you get to read accuracy of 100%. And this is also illustrated in this graph, or this alignment, where um, you can really see that when we align these reads back to the genome, there is almost no error left. We have this one persistent G that keeps being there, but at this point, I'm actually not convinced that that's not a PCR error. Um, it, might, it might be. And uh, <clears throat> the 5% mutation rate that we know that we have is what we also see when we, uh, in all our reads. So um, with that, I just, uh, yeah, of course, the future directions of, of what we're going to do is to, uh, to go down in, 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 in variant frequency and to look at more regions. And of course, we, we want to try using cell-free DNA. And that, I think, was all I wanted to say about short reads. I want to now invite Owen up to speak about um, slightly longer reads. And Owen, is the, Owen Harrington is the director of, um, such a director of bioinformatics in my team. So welcome, Owen. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about PORC today. Thank you, Andrew, for hyping me up. Um, so for uh, some of you here you, uh, who are veterans of London Calling and NCM, you might have heard us talk about PORC before. Um, it's a collaboration that goes back almost two years with Marcin Imolinsky's lab um, in Cornell and NYGC. Um, and over the last few months, even since London Calling, we've had, you know, made great strides in the protocol. So it's now available on the community. We've got tools and pipelines available on, on GitHub along with some sample data. We've got a preprint that came out last month, so please take a picture of this QR code and, and follow up, because this is a short talk. I won't be able to get to go into a ton of detail. Um, so if you're interested, please do read the preprint and, and talk to us at the posters. So what is PORC and, and why should I care about it? So uh, as some of you may know, the um, uh, DNA is just not randomly distributed within the cell nucleus. It actually forms these uh, highly structured, it's highly structured within the nucleus. At the low end, you've got chromatin fibers, TADs, AB compartments and chromosome territories. And the way this has typically been studied is with a group of methods called uh, chromatin conformation capture, or 3C. Uh, and this essentially kind of measures how close two points in the genome are uh, spatially. And the readout is done using short read technologies. And, and the way you analyze it is by looking at these things called um, contact maps, which you see on, on the right. Um, and each of the structures on the left there has a kind of corresponding pattern in the, the conformation map on, on the right. Um, and the reason, you know, it's pairwise, the reason there's these two dimensions to these uh, conformation maps, they look like these 2D matrices, is because the readout is generally done using short reads. So this is what the, the HiC um, protocol uses. And that means you can only capture pairs of points uh, in space, so you lose kind of a lot of the spatial information by, by doing that. So PORC is our attempt to go beyond that and to actually capture multi-way contacts in individual reads. And it's actually a very, you know, relatively simple protocol. Um, you, you start with by cross-linking uh, chromatin within the, within the nucleus. This essentially kind of freezes the DNA spatially uh, by using the protein-protein links. Uh, then you do a restriction digest, which creates uh, free ends, and then you do a proximity ligation. And this ligation event creates these chimeric junctions, and that junction essentially encode, encodes that spatial information that we're after. And after that, you just purify uh, and do library prep, and you get these long concatamers uh, where each kind of segment is a different restriction fragment. 
The analysis, uh, we had to build our own analysis tools because there's nothing quite out there yet, but it's, it's relatively straightforward. You uh, align against the reference genome. Essentially, you've got a virtual digest of your reference genome, so you know where the restriction endpoints are. And then you go back and try and assign you know, each of the segments in your read to uh, the Cognate uh, restriction fragment. The next step in the analysis is to kind of pull out all of that proximity information. Uh, so you can do this in two ways. So one is you just look at the direct contacts here. So you've got nine is next to seven, seven is next to five. So that's you know kind of what, what you're looking at there. And this is kind of equivalent to those short read approaches because you're looking at like direct proximity in the in the ligated junctions. But what you can also do is look at these indirect relationships. So nine is next to seven, seven is next to five. Therefore, nine is probably also close to five spatially. So this kind of expands the range of what you can look at. You get um, you get higher data density. So for every single read, you get n choose two, so the binomial coefficient, number of pairwise contacts from that read. So even with, you know, let's say 18 restriction fragments in an individual read, you get 150 pairwise contacts. And the graph on the right there just kind of plots this data density. So, you know, the number of pairwise contacts per gigabase of sequencing that you get is almost equivalent to, or is roughly equivalent to high C and, and, and exceeds it in some situations. The other thing you get is extra distance information. So this is kind of, you kind of hop along the genome, so you actually can cover larger ranges of distance. Um, so even with relatively short reads, so poor C reads themselves are, are not super long, you know, there may be three up to eight, 10 KB, you can actually span, you know, tens of megabases in, a, in an individual read. Um, so, you know, I've been talking about pairwise contacts, and that's essentially the short of it. Um, we talk about pairwise because that's essentially what the field uses. Uh, that's what all the tools use. That's how we analyze the data. But by you know, decomposing things down to pairwise interactions, you're throwing away all of that higher order information that's in the poor C read. So I want to focus now a little bit on how you might you know, factor that back into your analysis to kind of um, study some biological phenomena. So one thing you can do, uh, and this is in the preprint, is you can kind of build these complex queries on the reads that you have. So there's two reads here that share some contacts but also have some mutually exclusive contacts. Um, so what you can do is go back in and kind of subset your reads based on very complex queries. And, and one of the things that we, we show in the paper is, this was from our collaborator, is that you, know, you can build queries that pull out uh, individual reads that kind of essentially span all of the AB compartments uh, for a single chromosome. So that's on the poster, and you know, please check it out later, and we, we can talk in a little bit more detail about it. But I want to talk now about something that, that isn't in the preprint and that we're hoping to get into the final um, paper when we do it. So one of those structures I showed you on the first slides, the, the chromatin structures, is called chromosome territories. And this kind of refers to the fact that individual chromosomes tend to occupy their own space within the cell nucleus. And this actually expands to homologous chromosomes as well. So a single allele will be kind of separate from the other allele. And this means that, you know, in most cases, a single poor C read will represent all of one allele. So that means you can go back in and look at the allelic phase across very long distances. And you can kind of do this in two ways. You can use poor C reads to phase, let's say, an assembly. Um, but you can also use, you know, a known phase SNPs to, to actually separate out your, um, your poor C reads. The other thing that are in those reads are, is um, DNA modification data. So we you know, PCR is an optional step in the PORC protocol. All of the ones we've done so far skip PCR. So you keep all of those DNA modifications in the read. And that essentially allows you to, you know, get this long range epiallelic information. So you can look at differential methylation at, you know, let's say imprinted loci or, you know, cell specific methylation. So the applications group, uh, what we try to do is apply this to, to figure out, you know, novel bio or you know, biological phenomena. So I've got one case study uh, where all of this kind of comes together that I think is, is pretty cool. So like I said, you can use you know, uh, known phased SNPs to phase your poor C reads to split them out. And what we've done here is taken the fact that the Genome and a Bottle Consortium have this fully phased SNP set for GM12878, the reference genome sample. So they know all the way along an entire chromosome which SNPs are from the paternal haplotype and which are from the maternal haplotype. And you can use that then to split your poor C reads into two buckets and build allele-specific contact maps. So these are contact maps, one for each allele. And what I'm going to show here is you know, one allele above the diagonal, one allele below the diagonal. And this is for an entire chromosome. Um, so uh, some of you probably aren't used to looking at uh, chromatin conformation maps, so apologies. But essentially what you should expect for two alleles 
from a, an individual chromosome is very little difference at this level of resolution. You would expect maybe smaller scale changes, but here across the entire chromosome, the allele above the diagonal is actually quite different from the one below the diagonal. And if I had longer, I'd build some suspense around this, but I'm going to do the reveal straight away. What you're looking at is X inactivation. So GM12878 is a female cell line. It's got two copies of the X chromosome. Uh, one of those copies is transcriptionally silenced to you know, compensate for the, the gene dosage uh, associated with sex chromosomes. Uh, and there's essentially a huge you know, set of uh, factors that are involved in X inactivation, and they kind of leave their traces in many different ways. And one of those is structurally. So the inactive X chromosome actually forms a very different structure. It's bipartite, so there's kind of these two super domains that are separated by this hinge region. And it segments off to, or it's separated out to a different part of the nucleus as well. Um, so that shows up in uh, chromatin maps as these two triangles uh, that you can see there, and the hinge region is kind of separated a well-characterized repeat region. The active uh, X chromosome, on the other hand, has a more typical kind of elongated structure and more typical of, of uh, human chromosomes conformation. Uh, so just putting it back up there, I've rotated it now so it's kind of in the same orientation as the, um, as the schematic on the right, and hopefully you can see those two triangles uh, above the horizontal line, and below the horizontal line you see this checkerboard pattern that's associated with AB compartments, which are kind of standard in, in human uh, chromatin uh, structure. And that's not the only kind of hallmark of, um, of X inactivation. The other, of course, is DNA methylation. So uh, between 80 and 90% of the inactive uh, X genes are transcriptionally silent. And one of the markers for this is the fact that their promoters are uh, hypermethylated. So if you took the same promoter region on the active X and compared it to the inactive X, you would see much higher methylation levels on the inactive X. So that is for uh, you know, 80 to 90%. The other 10% of genes are called escapees. They escape X inactivation to have um, transcription, albeit at a low level. And these genes have very similar methylation patterns uh, across the alleles. So what we wanted to do is go into our PORC reads and check if this is true. So this is in the PORC reads themselves now, not GDNA. So I've got two graphs. So one is just comparing the mean methylation um, from the, uh, so again, we've separated our PORC reads. We're calculating the mean methylation signals uh, on each of the two bins. Um, and what you can see for the, the genes that are subject to X inactivation, they have much higher uh, methylation levels on the inactive X. And there's two graphs here. One is just by gene, and the other is kind of centered on the transcription start site. And you can see those diverging um, you know, patterns suggest that there is differential methylation happening. And what about the escapees? Well, they actually have very similar methylation patterns in their PORC reads uh, across both, uh, both alleles. Um, so that's just one kind of example. It was a, a little bit rushed, but um, essentially we, what we think is the PORC reads themselves are a very rich data type that can be applied to a whole range of, of different um, applications. So we're starting to look at you know, primary tissue and different organisms. I think phase diploid assembly is going to be a, a big focus for us in the short term. And, and of course, looking at things like complex structural variation is going to be made a lot easier by this. Um, we have posters up on this. This is uh, the apps team for all of the stuff that Cecil and I talked about. Um, so please do find us over the next two days and, and ask us questions, and we'll be happy to answer. <laughs>